Good morning. Welcome to Park Road Baptist Church on a cold, finally a cold winter morning. Delighted to have you here today. It's warm in the room and that's what counts. Thank you to Chris White for this beautiful pre-service music. We're so delighted that he is able to come and play. He'll be with us again next week and you'll enjoy his piano music. I told Chris he could come as early as he wanted and play and you could come and come and sit and uh, have a few minutes to prepare to worship. So thank you, Chris, for that beautiful music. Following this brief announcement, Matthew Manwarren, who is back for a couple of weeks for us, will do our opening voluntary. So we're grateful to have good music all around today. I want to say thank you for uh, our cleanup crew yesterday, Laura and Brooks Baxley, Lisa Mason, Ryan and Kathleen Carrier, Matt and Laura Leach, Kay Thornburg, and I'm going to give the award for yesterday's cleanup to Ben Heaton because if you're a college kid and you come show up on Saturday to clean up the church after Christmas, you ought to get some kind of award. So thanks to Ben Heaton and to the rest of our cleanup crew for all your hard work yesterday. We really appreciate that. The only other announcement I'm going to make is to call your attention to the insert in your bulletin. For this season of Epiphany, we're inviting you to consider your service and places where you might be more involved. You have a lot of opportunities here to get involved, um, and if you'd like to be involved, take a look at this, and there are sign-up sheets in Health Hall. You can sign up following today's service or any of the services in Epiphany. We're delighted to have you this day. Thank you for being here. Let us continue to worship God as Matthew plays for us.
you please join me in reading responsibly the litany of worship? The world calls for our commitments. And offers only trinkets and fleeting pleasure in exchange. So as we worship on this baptism of the Lord Sunday, To the love of God, may it be so. Please join me in prayer. Dear God, life is full of commitment. We commit our time to work, family, friends, and many other things. Life is full of so many commitments that we sometimes overcommit, which neg negatively impacts how we work and live. On this Sunday, as we study the importance of baptism as a commitment to you, Help to remind us to focus on the good commitments in our life. Lord, we know the best commitment is to remember that you are with us from the beginning and until the end, as well as during the bad times and the good. We ask that you help remind us in our busy lives to commit time for you, for when we commit time for you, this allows us to be the best version of ourselves. We pray this prayer in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying... What are you committed? To what are you committed and to what might God be calling you if you were really listening? Are you listening? Is there some calling you have not responded to? Are you afraid? Are you too comfortable? Are you unwilling? To what are you committed? And to what might you be committed if you let God speak to you? Let us keep this moment of silence together. Now would you join me as we pray together our prayer of confession. Our scripture says, do not fear, yet we must confess that we are afraid, often at every turn. We are taught that God has redeemed us, but we often wander about, feeling lost and alone. God calls us by name, and we don't answer, promises to be with us through thick and thin, and we don't even notice. God calls us precious and loves us with a costly love, and it's never enough. God, forgive us. Through the waters of baptism or the fires of life storms, 
May God reform us and recreate us in the image of Jesus, that we might live strong and free. Amen. In this season, calling you to commitment, we are reminded every week of the commitment God has made to us. You are loved, you are forgiven, so be at peace. The text from Isaiah is poetic and beautiful. You've heard it twice this morning, first in the opening hymn and then in the prayer of confession. I share with you from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. But now, thus says the Lord, the one who created you, O Jacob, the one who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. I love to remind people who say, you know, the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath, and the God of the New Testament is a God of love. There's no stronger statement of the love of God to be found in the Bible than in this text from Isaiah. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. It's the same God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You have heard the ancient story. Each Sunday during this Epiphany season, we're dividing the sermon time into three parts, not three full sermons, I hope, dividing the sermon time into three parts. Uh, at the beginning of, of this time, I'm going to be doing an interview, and today Mallory Brown is going to come as I introduce her, and then I'm going to join her, and we're going to talk together. Mallory was raised in Shelby. She was a good Baptist church girl. She went every time the door was open to First Baptist Church. Her mama played the organ there. After high school, she went to App State and then uh, majored in ed elementary education. After her App State degree, she went to the seminary at Gardner-Webb, which is called the M. Christopher White School of Divinity at Gardner-Webb. M. Christopher White played the piano for us this morning. We're delighted to have him and Linda in our congregation. 
After graduating with a Master of Divinity degree from uh, Gardner-Webb, she married Ben, who was also a student at Gardner-Webb. We have a handful of Gardner-Webb Divinity School students, Chris, you'll be glad to know that. Um, they've been married since 2015, and two years ago brought the beautiful little Annie Kate into the world. She's a delight for them and for us. Since graduation from Divinity School, Mallory has worked in several local churches, including a stint as the children's minister at Park Road Baptist Church. What a wonderful uh, memory we have of that time together. She's also worked in public school education and most recently has worked at St. Uh, John's Baptist coordinating social media and email and also working with a, a nonprofit called Baby Bundles, which meets the needs of mothers and babies. We're delighted to have Mallory today with us, sharing her testimony, her word. So I'm going to join her and we'll talk together. Mallory, thanks for coming. I hope everyone can hear you. Let's make sure. Okay. Is that good? Is that good? Okay. Yes. Um, Mallory was raised like I in a Southern Baptist church, and uh, today is Baptism of the Lord Sunday, and even though that's not really the focus of our theme for today, I thought I'd begin this uh, interview about calling, asking Mallory to share with us briefly about her baptism and how that might relate to your sense of calling. Sure. Um, so growing up, we learned that baptism was a profession of faith. It was a very public thing at my church. You had to go down front and speak to the minister who was standing there during the last hymn, just like most Baptist churches. Um, so that was a little intimidating, but there are also rumors that if you got baptized, you would actually go to heaven. And that was where all your dreams would come true. You could have pizza every day for dinner. Um, <laughs> and some folks that I know have a really jaded um, view of their baptism. Um, they did it out of peer pressure, or you know, they feel some sort of negativity towards that and I understand that I've sat in those services on the last day of camp where everyone cries and weeps and dedicates their life to Jesus and I've been at funerals where altar calls are kind of uncomfortable and scary <laughs> and you have to raise your hand while everyone closes their eyes and um, so I, I, I get that jaded view for a lot of people but for me um, I don't look at my baptism negatively at all um, and I don't want to go back and rededicate my life to Christ or anything like that. Um, I was baptized in sixth grade, which is a lot later um, than most of my friends. They were, you know, four and five years old. Um, and when I walked down front at First Baptist in Shelby, I, I distinctly remember um, an, an inner pull um, inside of me. Um, there was, you know, like a lump in my throat and... Um, there was just something inside that I sensed that this was something that I needed to do, and perhaps it was some sort of societal pressure, but um, I really do think that the Spirit was moving in my life at that time. Um, and ever since then, that same inner pull has come up again at different points in my life. I really appreciate that testimony. I, I resemble almost all of the remarks that Mallory just made there. Uh, I understand the skepticism, uh, but we really believe baptism is a beautiful symbol, a wonderful way to begin a commitment of life. We always encourage our children and youth. We'd love for all of them to be baptized. Last, uh, on Christmas Eve, we had a beautiful baptism. Reed, Heaton, and Amy in the, in the waters of baptistry. A beautiful testimony. Thank you. Our text for today is a beautiful passage from Isaiah. When you pass through the waters, maybe a different kind of waters than baptismal waters, God says, I will be with you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Now, the prophet doesn't say if you walk through the waters, but when you experience these challenges of life. When you walk through the waters, God will be with you. As a woman growing up in the South, and in this culture, and choosing a path of, of seminary and toward ministry, which some people still think of as a male profession, uh, thinking about ministry as a career, well, you've experienced some challenges. Um, what would you share with us about those challenges and how you've experienced that promise of God, I will be with you? Sure. Um, when I decided to go to seminary, um, it was 2012, and I was looking for a way to sort of raise my voice and um, find a career and a life that felt more like myself. Um, college was extremely difficult for me um, because of anxiety and an eating disorder and other sort of 
college is just really hard. People don't talk about that. It's, it's wonderful, but it's so hard. Um, and I just wasn't ready to jump into the real world yet. Um, so choosing to go to seminary didn't make sense to people in my family, especially, my, especially my mom, who grew up with a minister as a dad, and she knew the, you know, dark underbelly of church, um, <laughs> how, it, how difficult and mean it can be sometimes. Um, and so she was really skeptical at first, but I knew that it was the right step for me. Um, it, it's, it, it was something I considered for a long time. Um, and even though it didn't make sense to other people, it made sense to me. Um, and little did I know that semi where seminary would lead me um, or where it wouldn't lead me, I don't know. Um, since graduation, like Russ said earlier, I've worked in several churches, mostly in children's ministry. I tend to get boxed into that kind of role, um, and I think it has a lot to do with just, well, I, I like to work with kids, but also I'm a young, petite woman. <laughs> so that um, people don't often see me as sort of like an authority figure or someone who could do something else. Um, so I have also worked in public schools thinking that maybe my ministry was, you know, out in the world doing that kind of work. Um, it's been a little all over the place for me um, since graduating, and I've never really had a job that I felt like this is it. This is what I'm meant to do. This is my calling. Um, and most recently, I've been thrust into the role of being a mom during the middle of a pandemic, which I'm not sure that I recommend. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been wonderful. Um, our daughter is a year and a half old, and I spend most of, my time most of my time taking care of her, and then I spend a few hours a week doing some contract work from home. Um, it's wonderful and really, really hard. Um, I know that I have something else to offer to the world um, that, you know, speaks that a way that I can speak my voice and what I, I don't know, but I just don't know what it is yet. Um, but I continue to feel that inner pull um, that I felt on that day that I went down front to profess my faith. Um, I, and I've felt that throughout, that I know that God is with me throughout the hard times and the wonderful times and all of that. So, yeah. You feel that inner pull, and yeah. keep listening to that, and you will, mm -hmm. you will find that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mallory Brown might be a, a young, petite woman, but a few years ago, she shared with us a story about her church, uh, First Baptist Church in Shelby, and a meeting in which she stood up, mm -hmm. shall I say, confronted the deacons in her home church. Um, and that's got to be a little bit like walking through the fire. I was so impressed with that story. I wanted you to share that with our congregation. Yeah, I... In preparation for this, I reread that letter that I wrote and read to them, and it's a little shocking to read. I'm like, wow, I can't believe that I did that. Um, it was pretty bold and wonderful yeah, to hear. Yeah. It really was. Um, so since high school, when I had friends come out to me as gay, um, I've wrestled with whether homosexuality was wrong or right, and I've heard all the things like hate, love the sinner, hate the sin, all of that, and none of that ever really sat well with me. Um, and in college, I was really against it, but I was against a lot of things in college, very legalistic. Um, and it was miserable um, trying to decide who's right, who's wrong, who's in, who's out. Um, so I just stopped all of that. Um, and that inner pull came again, and I just let all of that go. And um, since then, I've sort of adopted a pretty liberal view of things. Um, and. I'm really passionate about the inclusion and acceptance of the LGBTQ community. Um, and while serving as a children's minister at First Shelby, um, they started the homosexuality conversation, um, which was chaotic. Um, and I got pretty fired up at times. Um, I spent hours talking to the youth minister, crying in her office, talking to people who were you know, on my side. Um, and the, the deacon board um, asked the ministry staff to, you know, write letters and speak. And they wanted us to sign um, an agreement that we wouldn't perform same-sex marriages. And I was just devastated. And so I wrote a letter, and um, I stood up and read it to them. And keep in mind that all of these people sitting in that room, most of them have known me my entire life. Um, so this it is was little Mallory Monroe, right, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, my yeah. mom plays the piano. You know, my dad. You know, it's just um, it was very, very 
intimidating, but it's what I had to do. Um, it was the inner pool, as I've said. Um, and a week later, I resigned from the position. Um, and I wasn't allowed to sort of say why I resigned. It was more of like, she's graduating and she's moving on. But really, I was resigning because it wasn't the place for me. I couldn't um, stay there with integrity. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for listening to that inner pool yeah. and for standing up. I really appreciate that. And uh, I, I still think about Mallory standing there in front of these deacons who had known her since she was this big and speaking her truth to them. And what a wonderful, wonderful witness that is to us. So thank you for that. Uh, finally, I want to know what advice you give to these folks from your experience um, with, with life and faith. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important um, and I don't know if I have a lot of advice to give, but I think listening to your gut is very important. Um, we all have that intuition and a hunch sometimes that this is right or this is wrong, and to listen to that. Um, and also to have people um, by your side that you can call or talk to. So that, that's my advice, just to listen to your gut and have people that are there for you. So. Mallory, thank you. Um, when we read scripture at... Park Road Baptist Church, we always say, you let, uh, listen, you've heard the ancient story. Let us listen now for the word of the Lord. And the point is that you can hear the word of the Lord in a lot of different ways. We have heard it today in Mallory's story. I've heard it again today in Mallory's story. I'm so grateful. And I want to end my time together with that word that Amy and I always end our sermons with. It's really a prayer. It's a one-word prayer, amen, which means may it be so. So the way Mallory has shared her story and the conviction she's had and the bravery she's had, may it be so. Thanks. When I was the campus minister at Samford University, 
a student brought me a book and told me that he wanted me to read it. Here I was, the minister, and he gave me a book that profoundly changed me. I thought that was my job, to impart wisdom and make a difference in the lives of the college students on that campus. I had a barely two-year-old at home and a three-month-old. I was back at work, only three-quarter time, but still, it was an adjustment. It was a new job, a shift in plans while on maternity leave. We had moved to Birmingham when I was seven months pregnant with our first child. We had moved for Russ's job. It was a good move, but now we were seven hours away from family instead of one and a half hours in a city where we knew no one. I had hoped that maybe, maybe the church that hired Russ would hire me also. We had worked on the same church staff so well together before, but alas, the pastor just didn't think it was a good idea for a married couple to work together. <laughs> Never works, he said. <laughs> Go figure. A few months after our first child was born, I found a job in something more akin to social work. It was a great experience for me. But then less than two years later, I was out on maternity leave again when this campus ministry job fell into my lap. I took it without hesitation. I think part of me was also trying to figure out how to stay in ministry outside of the church, just in case Russ and I didn't get the chance to work in the same church ever again. Thank you, Park Road. So there I was in my new office trying to learn how to do yet another new job, leaving two sons in daycare, pumping milk, juggling all the things, all the things. Do you ever look back on pieces of your life and think, how did I do that? If I knew that that was what I had to do, I don't think I would have done it. And in the midst of all of that, a student brings me a book and asks me to read it. That's about the last thing I had time to do, was to read a book that some religious college kid thinks that I ought to read. I don't think I've ever had a book land in my hands at a better time. I think I was passing through the waters and walking through the flames when I read Henry Nouwen's book, Life of the Beloved. I have quoted this so many times in the last 21 years of preaching here, but some things just bear repeating, you know, like there was a baby born in Bethlehem. We tell that story over and over. Well, Henry Nouwen's Life of the Beloved needs to be retold. It's the section that I've included on the front cover of today's bulletin that still to this day, some 23 years later, it stops me in my tracks. It's Nowen's take on Isaiah 43, really. He says, aren't you like me hoping that some person, thing, or event will come along to give you that final feeling of inner well-being you desire? Well, you and I don't have to kill ourselves. We are the beloved. We are intimately loved long before our parents, teachers, spouses, children, and friends loved or wounded us. That's the truth of our lives. That's the truth I want you to claim for yourself. That's the truth spoken by the voice that says, you are my beloved. Listening to that voice with great inner attentiveness. I think Mallory kept talking about that pull. I think the way now when talks about it is listening to that voice with great inner attentiveness. I hear at my center words that say, I have called you by name from the very beginning. You are mine and I am yours. You are my beloved and on you my favor rests. I have molded you in the depths of the earth and knitted you together in your mother's womb. Wherever you go, I go with you and wherever you rest, I keep watching. Nothing will ever separate us. We are one. Here I was in, well into my career, juggling all the things, feeling so overwhelmed. And this young conservative whippersnapper college student comes to me and says, I think you need to read this book, Amy. And my eyes were open. 
Now and says, every time you listen with great attentiveness to the voice that calls you the beloved, you will discover within yourself a desire to hear that voice longer and more deeply. It's like discovering a well in the desert. Once you have touched wet ground, you want to dig deeper. The day that I read that something within me eased, not that I've not been out of sorts since then. Not that I've not been overwhelmed since then. Not that I've not had moments that I felt like I had more than I could handle since then. But I guess I've spent 23 years digging a little deeper in listening for the voice that calls me. Me. Beloved. As I mentioned last week, Isaiah is speaking to a group of haggard people. They are tired, worn out, exhausted, tired, defeated, depressed. Having returned from a time of exile, life was difficult and disappointing and exhausting. One might think that returning to a homeland would be all bliss. One would be wrong, if that is what one thinks. Prophetic voices can tend toward the warning and scolding side of things. But here in this beautiful section of what is known as Second Isaiah, the prophet is not filled with warnings over wrongdoing, but with encouragement to re-evaluate Judah's past and future. This section of Isaiah was composed for an exiled people in the mid-6th century BCE, just as the international tide is turning, just as the possibility of returning to the broken city of Jerusalem is reopening, this second Isaiah soars with inviting poetry of hope offering to pave the way homeward with confidence and expectancy. Of course, it's written in hindsight, which is how we most often understand the presence of God. In each of our callings, sometimes we need a good, stern warning. In each of our callings, sometimes we need a push. In each of our callings, sometimes we need to be told about justice and our work in it. Sometimes in our callings, we need a reprimand for our selfish ways. And sometimes we need somebody like Isaiah to acknowledge that we have passed through the waters and walked through the fire and that God has been with us every single step calling our name, beloved. You. You! Can you believe it? And with that kind of reminder, we may find within ourselves the ability to persevere. That's what I hear in this text from Isaiah, perseverance. It's what I hear in Mallory's story as a kid, as a college student, as a minister in her own church, as a public school professional, perseverance. And listen to her. She hasn't figured it out yet. She's a mom. She's supposed to know everything. No, we know nothing. perseverance, that maybe, just maybe, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how many things we are juggling, no matter how overwhelmed we feel, that we will not be completely overwhelmed by the waters or consumed by the flames. We've started binging a new show. You know about pandemic binging, don't you? I'm actually binging two at one time. They're both British, and I feel like I'm practically speaking British right now. Am I? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm practically sp speaking British. You hear that? Well, 
It's an old show that somehow we've missed, but I tell you, it's one of the most beautiful and poignant shows we have ever seen. Once you are immersed in a text during a week, the text Isaiah this week for me, when it's especially that poetic kind of way of wording things like Isaiah 43, then everything you see and everything you hear speaks to that text. Well, last night, the episode was filled with tragedy and sadness, and it ended with this word of hope. A word of hope from a Jewish woman who had lost almost her entire family at the hands of Hitler. And years, years later, she said in the face of life's deepest challenge and pain, you just have to keep living until you feel alive again. You just have to keep living until you feel alive again. And I thought, that's what Isaiah said. Do not fear, I've redeemed you. I've called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. You just have to keep living until you feel alive again. So in all of your callings, may you hear that voice very clearly calling you precious and beloved. And may you simply want to dig deeper when you pass through every water and when you walk through every flame. May it be so. Amen. Our litany this morning spoke of make, making lasting commitments. Amy used the word perseverance, stick to the persistence to keep doing something despite difficulty in achieving success. You folks know about perseverance when it comes to our service to the Charlotte community. Park Road began packing 35 snack bags a week for students at Sedgefield Elementary more than 10 years ago. Those same students have changed principles multiple times since then and even moved to a different school. And still today, we are delivering now over 100 snack bags every week. If you want to know about perseverance, talk to one of our tutors who are helping struggling students with reading or math. And we have, without a doubt, one of the most organized book giveaways in the city and have donated thousands of books over the past several years to students who otherwise would not have them perseverance. Charlotte Family Housing had, it, had its roots in family promise, a group that from the very beginning was housed in our youth building. Over the years, many of you have served as overnight hosts with them or provided child care or meals when needed. Last night, we hosted eight men and four women for Room in the Inn. We have been doing this twice a month from December through March for more than 20 years, since the very beginnings of Charlotte's Room in the Inn program, Perseverance. For many years, we've enjoyed a wonderful partnership with the church in Cuba, and many of you have visited there and made lasting friendships with their people. Do you know that our church's partnership with Carlos Rojas 
is the longest standing partnership of any that were begun by the Alliance of Baptists years ago. When it comes to ministry in the wider community, clearly you folks are not quitters. You persist despite the obstacles in providing food and shelter for the homeless, educational support for students in underserved schools, and friendship and encouragement for those in need. I hope this is all good news to our guest this morning. Caroline Cox, if you would come, she is the program director for Families Forward Charlotte, an organization that works directly with the poor in Mecklenburg County. They are a new organization for Park Road, and hopefully one with which we can build a lasting, persevering relationship. Caroline. Um, I am Caroline Cox with Families Forward Charlotte. So we are a local nonprofit that partners with families in the area who are living in poverty with the purpose of helping them achieve long-term stability for their families. We were founded in 2017 following a study out of Harvard and UC Berkeley that ranked Charlotte 50 out of 50 for upward mobility across all major U.S. cities. And so what this basically means is that if you are born living in poverty in Charlotte, you are likely going to stay in poverty through your adult life. So our organization is working to com combat those statistics and end generational poverty for the families that we serve. So families are referred into our program from our partner Title I elementary schools as well as other partner nonprofit organizations. When a family enters our program, we set the adult in the family up with a volunteer mentor from the community who we call family liaisons. And they work together for one to two years um, with the liaison helping guide that family in setting and achieving self-sufficiency goals. So goals can include finding housing, um, finding employment, finding employment that pays a livable wage, um, budgeting, just kind of whatever that family's specific need is. They're there to help support and guide them to achieve those goals and reach stability. We do monthly educational workshops for all the families in our program, and these are done in collaboration with other community partners who will come in and present on topics such as financial literacy, parenting skills, first time home buying. We have life coaches come in and do life skills workshops. Um, and then we do essential support for all the families in our program. So three times a year, every family gets a basket of cleaning supplies and toiletries, which we call essential baskets. We do school supplies for all the kids in our program, holiday meals and gifts for all the adults and children in the program. And then we have $1,000 budgeted for every family in the program that they can request at any point to help them overcome barriers to success. So that money really serves as a safety net for them when unexpected expenses come up, um, car repairs, hotel costs for families who are facing homelessness, um, rent and utility, phone and internet bills, medical bills, child care costs. That money is there to help them and be available so they don't fall behind. We have served over 100 families in Charlotte since our founding, and we currently have 46 families active in our program with the goal of serving 70 families for this year. Um, there, we have numerous ways to get involved with our organization and support our mission and help us reach this goal of serving 70 families. We are currently recruiting family liaison mentors right now. So we have two trainings coming up in January um, with an opportunity to train to be a mentor and then get partnered with a family in the community who is experiencing poverty. Um, the commitment for that opportunity is about four to six hours a month for one year. Um, I did it for two years before I moved into this employer role, and it's a really amazing experience, and you really get to see the impact that your time and um, commitment has in supporting a local family. Additionally, we have opportunities throughout the year for donation drives and packing events for those essential baskets and the school supply drives and the holiday meals that we do throughout the year. 
Um, so I will be in the health hall after this. So if anyone wants to hear more about how you can get involved and learn more about our program, I'm happy to answer any questions and speak with everyone about it. But we are just so appreciative of your support this month of our organization and the opportunity to come share our mission with you. So thank you. Thank you, Caroline. You will be hearing more about Families Forward Charlotte and ways that we all can be involved with them. We hope that it'll be the beginning of a long lasting relationship with your organization. Would you join me now for our prayer of intercession? Gracious and loving God, God of promises and perseverance, source of joy and source of hope, hear our prayers. In the calm of this beautiful space, we are mindful of those who do not know the beauty of friendship and community, the assurance of daily bread, the peace of life without violence or war. So we lift up to you those people around the world who suffer this day, the poor, the hungry, those facing illness and death. We lift up to you those places torn apart by war and conflict and natural disaster. As if we need to lift them up to you, you are already there, compassionate and strong. Help us to follow your example and to help as we can. In the calm of this beautiful space, we are mindful of those in our own community who are wracked with worry and anxiety about their health or the health of those they love, about work or finances, about their kids' well-being and their education and their social lives. We lift up to you all who are anxious about so much as if we need to lift them up to you. You are already with them, the still small voice in the midst of the storm, reminding them to breathe and to trust. In the calm of this beautiful space, we give you thanks for this time for this time set apart to worship. We lift up to you all our praise for the good in life and for the struggles that help us to grow. We lift up to you that which we cannot name aloud. We lift up our hearts, knowing that you hold them in your hands. Amen.
want to thank Brian Rudolph for a wonderful prayer as we began our service today. I want to thank Chris and Matthew and Rebecca for beautiful music. I want to thank Mallory for a powerful message and Dan and Caroline Cox for a wonderful challenge. I hope you hear it a hundred times in the next two months. To what are you committed? Are you listening? To what call, what inner pull do you need to respond? If joining this church would be part of that or any other commitment, Amy and I would love to welcome you. As we stand at the front, we will sing three verses. Make a commitment. Join us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God give you grace this day to love with all your heart. To love with all your soul. To love with all your mind. As you go in the, in the world this day, dear friends, love the Lord your God with all your strength.